Welcome to the ASCO University Weekly Podcast. My name is Dr. Alexander Drillon, and I'm the Clinical Director of the Early Drug Development Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Each week, members of our expert faculty will present a new episode based on either a self-assessment question, a new drug in oncology, or an ASCO guideline. Self-assessment question episodes review a high-quality question from an existing ASCO University e-learning course with topics taken from areas identified on the ABIM exam blueprint. Our new drug episodes outline a newly approved drug in oncology, including the rationale behind the drug's use, the approval date, and relevant clinical trial data that supported the drug's approval. ASCO guidelines episodes give information on a recently released ASCO guideline, including the purpose, method, results, and recommendations for each guideline. Learners may subscribe to the podcast in order to receive automatic updates when new content is released. For more information, visit our comprehensive e-learning center at university.asco.org. Thank you for listening to the ASCO University Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much for having us today. My name is Nina Shah from UCSF. And I'm Rachna Shroff from the University of Arizona. It's 2018 today, but our journey began 11 years ago at a little known institution called MD Anderson Cancer Center. We want to tell you a little story about two girls who wanted to become the best oncologist they could possibly be. We just had no idea that this would give us one of the greatest gifts of a lifetime. Many people will tell you that if you want to be a successful oncologist, you have to work hard, see a lot of patients, publish a lot of papers, and have great mentorship. But what you don't always hear about is a secret key ingredient, friendship. So Rachna and I learned about this secret ingredient as we progressed through our fellowships. As we went through our training, our interests divided between hematology and solid tumor, but we had the same goals in mind, and we also came from similar backgrounds, including similar families, similar values, and most importantly, we had similar academic goals. I'll never forget the first day we met in the white coat line during fellowship orientation. At that time, we were focused on two things, academic success and how we were ever going to get used to living in Houston. We were both transplants to the city and initially bonded over trivial things, like having the same DJ at our weddings five years apart in New York and Arizona. Over time, however, we realized that there was so much more to our paths crossing. As our training progressed, we became the greatest source of motivation for each other. If there was a grant application, we'd tell each other to apply for it. When we didn't get the grant, we'd tell each other to apply again. At meetings and conferences, we would sit in the front row, even yesterday, (laughs) cheering each other on, even if we had no idea what the topic was about. By the time we reached the end of fellowship, we thought we had it all figured out. We had become mothers and were balancing work and home life as best as we could. And as we embarked on the academic job hunt, we pushed each other to try to get the most out of each of these experiences. In the end, we chose to start our careers as junior faculty at MD Anderson, and we couldn't have been happier. It also gave us some comfort in knowing that we were going to be able to navigate the waters of being assistant professors together. But soon after, we were faced with a new challenge. Each of us had a parent diagnosed with cancer. This began the next phase of our training. How were we going to learn to be an oncologist and a caregiver, a doting daughter and a loving mother? Before, we had taught each other about striving for success, but now we were teaching each other about life. As there were more things put on our plate, we taught each other how to handle them all. One would see the other one handling it all and know that she could do it too. We pushed each other to become better people and better doctors. And during this time when each one of our parents was going through chemo, we had babies, We wrote papers, we gave talks, and we put people on clinical trials. And at each step, we were there to help each other, cheer each other on, or maybe even comfort each other if things didn't go as planned. We started to learn that we had to make some compromises. We reminded each other that we were only human. Sometimes you have to be a better clinician than researcher. Sometimes you have to be a better wife than colleague. But at each fork, you have to push yourself to be the best person you can be. The second fork came when we reached that age-old decision of question of leaving the nest. I was offered an exciting career opportunity that would force me to step out of my comfort zone and leave the only place I'd ever known how to be an oncologist 
and the people who had supported me there. But Rachna was my constant voice of reason, even though I know that she could have selfishly told me to stay. She instead told me to take a leap of faith and encouraged me to move on and has been by my side from afar, even though we're at different institutions, as I've learned the ins and outs of a new place. As tends to happen, one year later, I was struggling with the same decision. My family and I had a wonderfully comfortable life in Houston, and I was debating a career move as well. Watching Nina soar so successfully gave me courage to think about taking a new job that offered different responsibilities and challenges. And importantly, I knew that Nina was in my corner as a sounding board as I navigated a new place and role. Now, at different places from where we first met, we continue to be each other's support system and continue to challenge each other to be better and to try harder. We don't always like what we will have to say to each other, but it's okay. We know that true, good-hearted honesty comes from very few people in your life. There have been and are so many times where I doubt myself, I think, can I really do this task? Am I up for it? Uh, can I possibly handle this with everything else I have going on? But that moment, those moments of self-doubt, that imposter syndrome, the, the real but silly feeling of paranoia, that is when you need a good friend. When I think about how oncology pulls at you, how academic medicine pulls at you, there are so many times that you can feel alone. It's simply impossible to accomplish everything on your to-do list. And I would venture to say that it's even more difficult when that to-do list includes scheduling piano classes and planning birthday parties. In this day and age of overwhelming red tape, overwhelming electronic paperwork, it's important to have people you can turn to to keep your compass needle steady, to let you know that it's okay to let things go, and on the flip side, that you really need to buckle down, focus, and work on a project, otherwise you'll regret it. Nina has been my true north since starting academic oncology. There is no RVU metric on the value of friendship but the commodity is priceless. And it may not seem this way, but it's true. How many times have you been at work annoyed and you want to send off an annoying email or go on an irate rant because of something that happened? I call Rachna first. <laughs> or how many times have you thought, I don't know if I should say yes or no to this project. I don't know if it's gonna, what it's going to mean to my career. I call Rachna first. And on a Monday afternoon when my husband called me to tell me that my father had passed away, I called Rachna first. Over the years, our friendship has become something that everyone in our lives and everyone at MD Anderson knows about. Maybe five years ago, people thought it was cute. Oh, they have a lunch buddy to eat lunch with. But since then, so many people have told us that it is a blessing, and we know that to be true. We are taught in medicine, maybe even more so in academic medicine, that you shouldn't be soft. You can be emotionally available to your patients, but not so much to yourself when it comes to your career. If we are going to change the story on equality, leadership, and physician burnout, then we have to recognize this one important fact. We are still human and have human needs. And though this may seem like something between two girls, we can honestly say that this goes beyond gender. We see this need for peer mentorship in our male colleagues as well. And we've seen the benefits of it through things like social media, where on Facebook there's a Hemonk Wolfpack group that supports each other. Oncology is changing. We are each becoming pulled in multiple directions 24-7, and this stretches all of us, men and women, emotionally. We have to fight against this by feeling the comfort of support, whatever that means to each of us. For us, we are that support for each other. There aren't any words, there aren't enough words to describe how grateful we are to be part of this wonderful profession. It's given each of us purpose and a drive to a cure, but it's also given us something we definitely never expected, this priceless gift of lifelong friendship. And this friendship, in turn, gives us strength and further motivation to help us to fulfill our dreams of being the best cancer doctors that we can possibly be. And in turn, we are each other's heroes. Thank you very much. <laughs>